This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. We're delighted to have with us tonight Chef Paul Onishi. Paul has been demonstrating and teaching food preparation and presentation for more than 20 years. He was one of the first sushi chefs trained in America. He owned and managed catering businesses in California and Hawaii, and he has taught cooking classes around the country. Well known locally for his outstanding culinary skills and as an exceptional caterer, he also teaches an alternative cooking program for at-risk youth at Barrington High School. In addition, just last month, he gave a series of healthy cooking classes for the faculty and staff of Punamo School as part of the Kaiser Permanente Kaiser on the Job program. Some of the recipes that he'll be demonstrating tonight were among those presented at Punamo. Please welcome Chef Paul Nishi. to be here. I was here a couple years ago, and we had a very large audience. Good to see a nice crowd here again. Uh, as they mentioned earlier, uh, I've been in a lot of different places. I just came back from Maui this weekend, and uh, we had a really nice reception with the folks over there. It was nice to see a lot of uh, people, I would say over half the audience, we're not vegetarian at all. They're kind of like our uh, promo was stating, uh, fence sitters, people that are, you know, kind of curious. How many in this group? I'm just curious. How many in this group uh, came because you're curious about what you read? You're not necessarily part of the vegetarian society. Okay. How many of you folks uh, still eat uh, red meat? Raise your hand. Okay. How many fish and chicken? Okay. How many people are um, vegan? You know what? Those of you that raised your hand and the rest of you that were kind of not too sure, of, this is a pretty good indication of what I've seen over the past maybe 10 years in, in talks like this that I've done. I did a class probably about that long ago at KCC. And uh, we had about, you know, five high core meat eaters. You can always tell because the wife's elbowing the husband off to the side. You know, and, and the guy comes up and talks to me at the end of the program. He says that, you know, that, that stuff that looked like dog food actually tasted good. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll get a chance to uh, see and taste the dog food. <laughs> A lot of the... Did you guys get recipes tonight? Yeah. Okay. All right. It's not like I'm trying to slide anything under the radar here. What I have for you is all legitimate. It all tastes good. And just to kind of give you an idea of, uh, very briefly, my background, as, as Alita said, that I teach an alternative cooking program at Farrington High School. My students are the ones that... Uh, don't want to come to school, they don't want to sit at the desk, they just want to cut school and do whatever. And so my program helps them get back on track. So in the course of our travels, for example, a couple weeks ago we went to Star Market at Camp Shopping Center, and before they went in, I talked to them about hydrogenated oil, you know, partially hydrogenated, etc. Then we went in the supermarket. How many of, of you really are not sure of what Partially hydrogenated or hydrogenated oil is raise your hand. You guys all know what, you guys heard the term trans fat? Yeah? Okay. Uh, just to give you some background on where I come from with trans fat, I used to live on the mainland for 23 years, and about 
20 years ago in the LA Times there was an article that appeared talking about trans fat, hydrogenated oil. And they said that the day would come when the government would make it mandatory and have labels on all food products and would be just as strict, if not more so, than cigarette advertising. Okay. Well, it took 20 years, and this year, in February, it became law. So I took my students there, and I told them about hydrogenated oil. I told them about trans fats. And um, just to give you an idea of where I'm coming from, if you learn anything from what I teach you tonight, just stay away from any kind of hydrogenated oil trans fat because it will kill you, guaranteed. Okay? For those of you that do not understand the history on trans fat, a group of investors got together they decided that they wanted to come up with a, a product that would help fatten turkeys. Okay? That's how it started off. So they pulled their money, came up with this compound that would be fed to turkeys and would fatten them up. Well, guess what happened to the turkeys when they fit up? They all died. Okay? The way you make hydrogenated oil is a simplified version. Um, and this I know because working in the food mm -hmm. industry, you know, this was taught, you know, told to me. Imagine a giant vat. Vegetable oil is put into this vat. Hydrogen gas is injected into there and is pressurized and all of a sudden it's put through a centrifuge. So this oil is being whipped around with the hydrogen gas. Through that process, what happens is that oil starts getting more and more like gravy and a little thicker to the point where if you let it go long enough, what you'll end up with is a brick of vegetable oil and hydrogen gas that you would have to break with a sledgehammer. Okay? So if you're thinking about, well, gee, if it does that, it's still soft when I eat it as mozzola, promise, margarine, etc. Okay? That is the one food item that does not come out of your system. Your body cannot digest it. Okay? Hydrogenated oil is one molecule away from plastic. Okay? If you put, you open up a tub of margarine with hydrogenated oil, you put it in your garage, you will notice that no flies will even come near it or light on it. If you leave it out there for a couple of weeks, guess what? There will be no mold on it. And, you know, with any other food product, you're going to see just that flies, mold, be ready to throw away. Okay, well, after these people found out that the turkeys died, they still wanted to cash in on their investment, so what they did was they said, we've got to go and do something with this stuff, because we've got a great thing here. So they decided to put a little yellow food coloring in there, a little chemical additive to make it taste like butter. Yeah. So guess what appeared on the shelves? Promise margarine, mozzola, and you know, my parents have been eating this stuff for years and years and years. Okay, and so have you folks probably. Okay. Just this year, a couple of days ago, my son comes home with a Cheetos package. Yeah? Zero trans fat, right in front. Why do you think they're doing that? Because they want to make you aware that, hey, we're conscious, you know, we don't do this stuff. Okay? So, all said, I took my 12 students into Star Market, and the first place they went to was, guess where, the chips and the cookies. Okay? First box they hit, Ritz crackers. Okay? And I kind of gave them a briefing on what to look for. So they looked over at the fats, the saturated fats. They said, oh, chef, zero trans fat. They were happy. Hey, we found one. I gave them each a piece of paper. I said, I want you to write down all the products in this supermarket that have partially or hydrogenated oil. Just because it's just partially doesn't mean it's a little bit less. It's still <laughs> bad. Okay? Poison is poison, no matter if you cut it in half or whatever. Okay? So came back and said, Chef, something's going on because over here it says zero trans fat on the bottom with the ingredients it says partially hydrogenated oil. Okay? I said, oh. How do you think they're doing that? So I explained how the government can allow you to fly under the radar 
and can allow you to put a certain amount in there. Okay, and about that time, we had that article come out in the newspaper about McDonald's. You see that? The amount of trans fat McDonald's puts in their, yeah, their food. Okay, and did you realize the United States puts 23%? <laughs> hydrogenated oil in theirs, as opposed to Sweden, only 6%. Yeah. Why? Better shelf life supposedly adds to the flavor. Okay. I don't think so. Do you know that our students walked around Star Market, the most dangerous aisle in the supermarket is the aisle with the cookies, the, the, uh, the snack food. We even went to the, the sugarless stuff. You know, the healthy food section? <laughs> they all have partially hydrogenated oil. Okay? All the Doritos chips, all the, the, all the chips, pretty much all the chips, they had zero trans fat on the bottom partially hydrogenated oil. So they're kind of like playing the game. All right? Do you know that the... I, get, I asked them, okay, we're going to play a game. You're going to find the one with the most, you know, gets the prize, right? How many items do you think they found? They found over 310 items at Star Market just in one aisle. Then they started going out to the other side. They found it in um, cream of mushroom soup. They found it in other things that, you know, frozen frozen items like Aunt Jemima's um, waffles. Yeah? Okay. So, you got to read the labels because... You can't say, well, just a little bit won't hurt because you've already put a lot in your body all these years, okay? Uh, if we're going to spin this another way, this, this whole talk from me would be labeled, you know, confessions of a food abuser. <laughs> it's funny that I ended up at Farrington. I grew up at, in Kalihi. I, went, I graduated from Farrington High School, and it's funny that the kids want to go to McDonald's now, the site of where I used to go and you know, that's where my abuse started, going to Kenny's Burger House at 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, eating a beefy boy, cheesy gal, chili with rice, uh, large fries and a chocolate shake, and that's one city. Okay. <laughs> when McDonald's came to Hawaii, you know, I just kind of like laterally transferred over, and I remember when I was in um, Chicago, there I am in my three-piece suit walking down Michigan Avenue. I thought, I'm going to go to McDonald's. So I went to McDonald's and ordered my usual like I usually do in Honolulu. Two Big Macs, a filet of fish, a large order of fries, and a chocolate shake. wonder why my vest was a little bit tight and I was belching on the way back to work. But to me, that was the way you ate in Hawaii. And I remember growing up in Hawaii, going to Leonard's Bakery, getting a dozen, dozen malasadas, rushing home because I know the milk was cold in the refrigerator, and I killed a half gallon malasadas, all 12 of them by myself, sitting there at 12.30 a.m., and wondering why I was uncomfortable the next morning. Okay. A couple of years ago, really a year and a half ago, I had a little bit of numbness in my arm, a little bit of tightness in my chest, Call my doctor. He said, from what you tell me, you better go to Queen's Emergency right away. I went in and I was so scared. All I know is the bottom number on my blood pressure was 100 and whatever. And uh, I was scared. I was scared. However, what's interesting is it didn't surprise me. And I told the cardiologist, you know, I said, if you're going to do an angiogram, you go in there, um, I'll just sign off because I know you're probably going to find something because even though I've changed my ways, changed my diet, this is an accumulation of many, many years growing up here where I just, either by ignorance or by choice, I did not eat properly. Okay? I have never been one to really show outwardly what was happening. However, I remember in California, somebody was saying one day, you know that lump on your neck, you know, it's kind of like a weird looking lump. I said, that's a muscle. So I don't oh, know, I should take a look at it. So I'm kind of trying to look on the side and see this lump. And I ended up going into the, um, my doctor, he says, 
I don't know, I think we better uh, start to press on your spine there. So I went in, had that taken care of, and I remember, you know, local anesthetic right on my stomach, and hearing the, the surgeon and the nurses laughing, he said, look at it, it looks like a fat turtle. So they pull out this thing and they jiggle it in front of my face. It was a piece of fat about this big. Looked like a McDonald's hamburger. <laughs> With feet and a head and a little tail. Looked like a little translucent turtle. And as, as kind of semi-conscious as I was, it grossed me out so bad. And I thought, how could I get something like that growing in my body? Okay. Well, it wasn't until a year and a half later... I started you know, feeling a tightness in my back when to see my doctor. He says, looks like you got a little nodule back there right dead center in your, your back. And he says, we better you know, ch- take a look at that. And sure enough, it was like the size of a pellet. And by the time they extracted that, you know, you think I would have a hard time with this. It was worse in the center of your back because I couldn't even move my arms. I couldn't even turn my body, bend over because it was centrally located. And it's those little things like that where I realized it was lifestyle and diet. I didn't accept it at the time. But it wasn't until maybe eight years ago I went into my urologist and he told me that uh, he mentioned the C word. To me I thought I will never never get close to cancer. But he said you know, what are you eating? What, What kind of stuff do you do? And at that time, I was uh, just opening up the Wiley Tea Room. We had a catering business there. And uh, my goal in life as a restaurant person was to find the best tiramisu and osobuko <laughs> in the world. So every place I went, that's what I would order off the menu. Those of you that don't know about osobuko, if you eat enough of it, it'll clog your arteries. Um, but I was having a great time. And I was starting to started to show it, uh, and right when my urologist caught me, I had a bare gut, triple chin, I was tired all the time, and when he said, you keep it up, your, your numbers are already showing, you're, you're a pretty strong candidate for prostate cancer. And I remember that um, October, he told me that, November, it's Thanksgiving, that was the sorriest Thanksgiving I ever had. I, I treated myself to maybe one shrimp tempura where everybody was eating barbecue this, you know, sushi all over the place. I just had that one piece of shrimp, and I went into Christmas and New Year's. And you know Christmas and New Year's in Hawaii is pretty serious food-wise. Uh, and I thought, gee whiz, you know, if this is what it's going to take. I, you know, i got to try in six months, I lost 35 pounds. No exercise, just by diet. My my pants went down two sizes. My blood pressure went down. My uh, cholesterol went down 70 points. And what was interesting was when I changed this diet, I didn't realize that I was going to lose weight for one. And um, then at that time, I think Terry Shintani was coming out with that book, Eat More, Weigh Less. And that's when I started getting curious. I looked at the book and I said, you know, maybe there's something to this this rabbit food thing. Um, maybe I should get more serious. Interestingly enough, um, as a food professional, that's when I hit the crossroads because, you know, I was working, I was the owner of a place that pushed meat, okay? Know, to it. rich sauces, heavy desserts, everything about it was very, very uh, dangerous. Okay. Tasted great, but not real healthy. And I had to make a personal choice. I remember walking to down to Earth, Kokua Koa, and it was like looking through a food museum. I didn't know what the heck I was doing there. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to try. I'd look up, I'd see all this different kinds of molasses, different kinds of ground nuts. I'd never seen a machine that grinds nuts into cashew butter. Okay. Um, but what I'm going to share with you tonight are a lot of things that can help you kind of get off the fence and transition. For example, this particular item here, Bragg Liquid Aminos, 
Okay. I don't want to get too much into the chemistry of it. There are people here that can do a better job answering, giving you that detailed information. But just from a cooking standpoint, if I take this, which is a little less sodium than regular shoyu, I take this and I take turbinado sugar. Okay, turbinado sugar is unrefined sugar you can get at the health food store. I mix it together, garlic, ginger, green onions. I can come up with a teriyaki sauce that is a lot healthier and it works. Okay, if I want to make a steak sauce, I use the same thing. Only I add this vegetarian Worcestershire sauce. You're very, very fortunate if you're here today because back then, five, even five years ago, these products were not on the market. Okay. Worcestershire had anchovies in it. This has nothing. This tastes just like. Terrific. The biggest find that, uh, you know, this, Hawaii is like best foods, right? Best food, potato salad. You go, you try this, okay? We're in Maui. We had people asking to, you know, taste it out of the jar because they couldn't believe it. They tasted it out of the jar. You know where they're going. Okay. There's about two or three versions of this. Look for the purple thing. Viganese is closest thing to best foods. Mayonnaise doesn't have egg, you know, and it works. Okay. You folks can take a look at the bottom. Okay. I'm going to add this Viganese into this product here, this concoction. And I'm going to show you how I put together part of the concoction. This is raw celery, raw onion, mango chutney, Madras Indian curry powder, Viganese, and can't see it, I'm, I'll pass the bag around here. This is soy chicken. Okay. Soy chicken, if you, if you decided to just nibble on this, tastes like a very beany piece of dog food. Okay. It's like something you'd feed your pet. Or maybe your pet won't even eat it. <laughs> we tried to feed our animals this. They kind of like smelled it and walked away. <laughs> but that was a challenge I had. I had to see if I could create the same kind of local flavors with what was out there, okay? And thank God <laughs> I can do it and actually, you know, it tastes good. <laughs> I was asked to cater a function for some teachers, 150 teachers. Uh, they wanted uh, Wildland Country Club curry chicken salad, which is what we used to do, which is the same recipe, okay? The only difference is they use chicken, we use this. I want to show you how it is to rehydrate this stuff. Okay, right now this is like a little crispy wafer. When I put it into water, boiling water or hot water, you're going to see within a couple minutes it starts rehydrating and actually develops a texture. If I cook it a long time, it'll get very spongy. If I take it out, I put it in a non-stick pan, I, I pour my favorite char siu sauce on it. My wife discovered that. You know. Pour a little char siu sauce on it, put it in a non-stick pan. No oil. You brown it up. Stick it in your freezer after it's done. When you add heat to it, it makes it a little bit drier and it gives you the texture of pork. So we put it in our freezer when you have salmon or fried rice or something. Take it out, chop it up, throw it in. Nobody knows the difference. In the case of this curry chicken salad, there's 150 teachers on the DOE that still are raving about this curry chicken salad that have no idea that they ate soy chicken. <laughs> <laughs> now what happens at this point I don't know if you can see this, but they're actually expanding two and a half times their size. Now, just because it says soy chicken doesn't mean it has any taste of chicken. It has the texture of chicken. I can even, if I use a little Bragg's and this, 
slice it up, I can put it in to a stir fry and make beef and broccoli or beef tomato. I've done that, people can't tell the difference. You have to take a little bit of time flavoring those ingredients. If you go to Down to Earth, Kukua, Huckleberry, any health food store, you're going to find a product that is mock chicken broth. Okay? If I take mock chicken broth, there is, there's even mock beef broth, I can add it into the water. And this, by the way, if I put a little less water in here, it'll soak up the water, just like a sponge. Okay? The only thing is, if you put it in your oven and decide to bake it, I did it, I want to make chicken saute. I put these things on skewers. I put the saute sauce on. I stuck it in the oven because I wanted that nice broiled effect. This is before I discovered. Just put it in a nonstick pan and it'll brown it. You get a nice texture. I put it in the oven. It dehydrated again. <laughs> and when I bit into it, I was so excited because I took all that time with the sauce. I bit into it, it was like eating an old shoe. So, <laughs> so I threw it out. But you know. The interesting thing about this, rather than throw it out, or for example, I had, uh, when I used to do beef, beef and broccoli, I used to marinate the beef in sugar, oyster sauce, soy sauce, sesame oil, etc., etc., garlic, ginger, whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All you cooks that know what I'm talking about when you make that. Okay. I marinated the same amount of time I did the beef, but what happens is this thing works faster. So when I tasted a little piece of it, it, would, it had absorbed so much into it that it was salty. So I threw the whole thing out. And someone told me, you don't have to do that. Just rinse it in a little water and take out the saltiness and it'll be just right. So I did that. And hey, it works. Okay. So here's that little piece of chicken that we had. A little piece of soy. Okay. And it's grown. Okay. Now, if I chop this up, put it in here, and do whatever, okay? You can put it into a sandwich, put it into a salad. Um, we even have used this as a chip dip. Really like a chunky chicken, mock chicken uh, dip, okay? So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to add the veganese. share a little secret with you on the prep because when I had to go to Maui uh, we were kind of stretching it on time I got done with work at 3 o'clock we had to catch a 4 o'clock plane to Maui and the plane was delayed and it's a good thing that we prepped all this stuff we were able to get off the plane I, I got there at 6.30 we set up by 7 we are ready to go with this whole demo right off the plane. That's another thing too. Not only can you teach a class, but you can probably cater a lot easier too. Now this cooking demo is a combination of different kinds of, you know, looks. I'm purposely showing you things that you can use to transition from a meat diet to a middle of the road diet. See, most people in Hawaii, most people that I've talked to have a problem with losing the texture. If you, because they miss the texture of of meat, it doesn't have to be meat in vegetarian food. Everything tastes mushier, it's too crispy, I feel like it's too vegetable, crunchy, too healthy. They shy away from it. But you have to transition people into it. I know I was like that, and I find a lot of people that are on the fence you know, if you come on a little bit too strong with them, you lose them, and they go, well, I'd rather die if I eat what I want. Okay? And I'm sure there's a lot of you that, that feel that way also. I have a rice dish here. 
and I decided I was going to experiment. This has basmati brown rice, regular brown rice, and jasmine rice. When I cook the three together in a rice cooker today, the, the aroma and uh, the uh, flavor is really nice. It's really a little bit on the sweet side because of the jasmine rice. And what I'm going to do today, real simple, okay? Real, real simple, but these are the kind of things that you can do to just take yourself from where you are to just kind of eating healthy. And this is kind of like a little bit borderline gourmet. I, um, when I exercise, I, I try to take a look at these fitness magazines, the shape magazines, and see what people are eating because they always have a section on spa cuisine and, you know, healthy food. And it's interesting, a lot of it is kind of where it's going with ingredients like this. How many of you have seen this in the store but, you know, are kind of afraid to approach it? Okay, this is a kabocha pumpkin. When I have my my kids cut this for, for me for classes sometimes when we do catering, I always pick the aggressive ones that need to get out a little bit of frustration. Does <laughs> any of you that have tried to cut this thing, you gotta be you have to be a little bit strong on your uh, push through the skin here, but you also have a lot of control. You cannot afford to just hack away with it, otherwise we go to Queens right away. Emergency. Very dangerous thing if you're not working with a sharp knife. This is something that my wife and I um, we discovered. We're going to share this with you. We did everything for this particular dish. This is the collard greens and portobello mushroom. Only I'm going to kind of twist it a little bit and share something just to give you a little bit different taste. You can always try the one in the recipe, but I'm taking things, some of the things that are popular. Now, when I went to Down to Earth to get this stuff, I found that they had uh, three kinds of kale, no collard greens. I'm used to using collard greens, but kale is good too, and I sometimes mix kale and collard greens. For those of you that don't you know, have never eaten collard greens before except maybe from a southern orientation with a lot of oil fried till they're dead. This pot here that we're serving you, I put in a non-stick pan, no oil, high heat, and I just stirred it down. They wilted. The liquid from the uh, uh, kale went down. And I should have saved the leaf here. This particular kale, the leaf was about this long, almost like a really fine um, cabbage and very easy to work with and all we did was cook it no oil, just the heat of the pan non-stick and I'll combine those for you in a minute here now what I'm going to do here with this rice is I'm adding cube kabocha that's been put in the oven for a little while just put it in a little water Bake it till it's still a little crunchy, just when it starts getting soft, but not mushy. Okay. You can see kabocha in two forms. This is your dessert tonight. This is a kabocha pudding. Okay. You can see by the texture here that I baked it a little longer, so we could just put it in a food processor. In this case, I put it in a blender at home and we whipped it with some coconut milk, applesauce, and a little turbinado sugar. So you get an idea of how this can taste. Okay. Now for this, I'm just going to add this into the rice. This is fresh parsley. You can do parsley, basil, mint, whatever you want to do. Excuse me. I'm going to mix this up. Do a uh, fast food tax. 
a fat tax on fast food? Or they're thinking about it? Let me ask you, who, um, what race is the highest incidence of osteoporosis in the world? What do you think? What's, what group of people do you think? Eskimos. Eskimos. Okay. They eat a lot of fish, no leafy greens, no fresh fruits. And even though they, I'm sure they get a lot of exercise, high protein diet correlates with osteoporosis. Okay. You know, my former lifestyle, I would go to Elliot's Chuck Wagon, eat a large slab of prime rib, a couple pieces of fried chicken, that would be dinner. The next day I'd kind of change up and I'd eat, you know, teriyaki beef sandwich or something. And then that night I'd, you know, have a piece of a mahi sandwich or something like that. But okay, most of us abuse animal protein way, way over. Okay. And when we do that, and, and don't get don't get me wrong, don't don't think that the men are uh, immune. It's just that men's bone mass is a little bit denser, it takes them a little bit longer to get it. Okay. If you're on that track, chances are every day you urinate out a lot of your calcium from your bone mass. Okay. And that is a government fact. So if you, there's a correlation between people that have high consumption of animal protein, high osteoporosis incidence. Okay. All right, this is the pureed cover chump. And to that, I'm going to add applesauce and coconut milk and whisk it in. Yes, uh, the question was, how do you deal with the, the squash? Leave the skin on or, or cut it? Uh, when I was first introduced to it, my mother was cooking it. She just leaves it, she washes the skin. She leaves the skin on, she puts it in the microwave and takes fresh miso. Some people do miso and peanut butter. A little bit of soy sauce and um, the flavor of the pumpkin mixed with the miso and the whatever. Yeah you'll taste it in a different direction. So let me show you how we cut this. See that? I have to... Okay. Now, at th this point, I can peel away the skin. Now this knife is fairly sharp. <laughs> but, you know... You have to, i got to put a little bit of effort into it. Now, when I get the skin off, let's say I don't want the skin on it. You can eat the skin. Yes, you can. You can eat the skin. And this kabuchai, if you compare uh, kabuchai at Dai Market, 89 cents to $2 and whatever at, <laughs> for the same size at Down to Earth, that's because this is an organic as opposed to not. Okay. So, if I have a piece like this, I just cut it. To make Julianne strips, and from here I can dice. We've actually taken the seeds out of this, rinsed it off, baked it in the oven. And what would be nice is we took the seed, we tossed it in a little bit of the um, vegetarian Worcestershire sauce and a little bit of turbinado sugar and make a nice snack. Here's the kale and portobello mushroom. So there's three kinds of, three kinds of kale and collard greens in here. Okay, I gave you guys a bonus. What I'm going to add to this this is real handy. Good spray. Good spray bottle. I'm going to put that in. Add a little bit of vegetarian Worcestershire sauce.
I have more we're going to add. Okay. Now this product, you don't, I didn't want to bring that bottle because it was so huge. But this is that sweet chili sauce from Thailand that you see. You know, the last time I saw it, someone was dipping their fried chicken inside of it. <laughs> so we'll mix this up, let the flavors get together. Your recipe has red wine, vinegar, garlic, and that works well too. This is a way that takes it in another direction. This is real good if you if you uh, want to have it with polenta. So, you ever see those little polenta tubes? Cut it up, pan fry it in a nonstick pan, a little bit of chunky tomato sauce, and serve this alongside with it. It makes a real nice complimentary uh, dish. Now, for this, uh, the pumpkin, going back to it. I have the applesauce, and this coconut milk I got from down to earth. Organic coconut. <laughs> Since I originally started seeking out new products, I tell you, just in the so many sections, the shelves have just exploded with so many new products that are health, health conscious, health friendly. You can really, literally have a new life of cooking. Those of you that like to cook, you know, I, I really have great time now trying to come up with um, things that simulate those items that I enjoyed before. For example, the other day when we were in Maui, we just cooked the uh, the kale and the and the uh, collard greens together in the microwave, and I decided to give it a little bit of a taste, and it tasted just like luau leaf. Now, if I took that and I took my soy chicken and I flavored it a certain way, if I used some liquid smoke and a little bit of the uh, red sea salt in there, I could literally make a healthy lala. Okay. Now this, don't get me wrong, this, this is not to say that you have to eat soy products, okay? Soy products I use as a transitional item. Now I have a couple bags of the soy chicken, and uh, the soy ground beef. And both of these items I may eat once every two weeks. Okay. Um, basically because they have over 30% fiber. They're real good at for cleansing you out. Uh, we actually took it on a cruise to Europe last summer. And I, took, I would take my little Ziploc bag of soy grounds and I would order a pasta sauce. When the pasta sauce would come, I'd ask for it in a separate bowl, and it was hot. All I'd do is I'd mix in my soy grounds. I'd have soy ground beef. It would clean me out, and I had a real nice tasting dish. So I was able to travel and adapt my lifestyle to whatever was available. See? And whatever, whenever you can do that and do it fairly successfully, then you don't have to worry about travel or diet or where you where you go to eat. Okay. A lot of uh, places, there's actually Vietnamese restaurants, the green papaya actually had, if you ask for it, a mushroom broth for the, uh, the noodles. The soup noodles don't necessarily come with the, uh, the broth made with um, the reduced veal bones. So this one is ready. So it's ready to go back. Now we're gonna. I'm gonna show you how I put together the filling for the Vietnamese stuffed grape leaves. When I was in Los Angeles many years ago, um, when the first Vietnamese restaurants came out, there was a the appetizer called beef in la lot leaves. It's 
basically ground beef and a spicy teriyaki sauce, and they put in rice. It's kind of on the mushy side, and they roll it in uh, what they call a lalat leaf. They weren't able to export these things over, so they were using grape leaves. And what's different about them is instead of uh, just rolling it up, they they actually grill it, put it on a grill. And so I adapted it where I could put it in a nonstick pan and just brown it, and it seals up real good. You can actually serve it as an appetizer, uh, hot or cold. And instead of using ground beef, I'm going to use the soy grounds. So I have some soy grounds here, equal parts of soy grounds and bulgur wheat. Now, bulgur wheat, how many of you are familiar with couscous? Okay. Couscous is the grain that's involved in that. So I have half, half. in the water, give it a stir. Now if this is boiling water, I just need to put the lid on it. I might have to cook it a little bit. The, uh, the couscous needs to have a little bit of time to rehydrate. And when this is ready, assuming that it is, I'll just take some garlic, ginger, little spray of rags, a little bit of turbinado sugar. And if I wanted to put in a little bit of chili paste or chili sauce, it'll be like a spicy teriyaki mixture. Instead of it being mushy, I have that nice chew from the bulgur wheat and I have the soy grounds that are going to taste just like ground beef and it's going to work for me. It tastes good and taking a regular grape leaf like this, roll it up, grill it, and you can even freeze these and bring them back and steam it. Okay. Now, when we had our class at Punahou a couple of weeks ago, a couple of interesting things happened. About five people from the uh, food service came in. The head of the food service was one of my students. And I could tell these ladies were real hardcore because they were looking at me like, you know, show me something. And, uh, <laughs> and luckily I did. Because <laughs> we met three times. I divided them into six groups. I actually came up with six different recipes per class, and every one was uh, a different type of vegetarian item. What was interesting, when I talked about hydrogenated oil, one of the ladies there run the snack bar at Punahou. She decided that she was going to check to see how many of the items they had in their snack bar were uh, hydrogenated oil. She came back two days later for the class and she just shook her head and you could see a little bit of tears in her eyes. She, I mean, this lady is not a vegan, not a vegetarian, I mean, but she did, there was something happening in her that I think she's going to make a choice. Okay. She, she kind of said, you know, you got to do something because every day we're killing our kids. That's a quote. Every day we're killing our kids. When I showed her the list of what my students, the, the one that was like 285, 312 different items, and they looked at it, okay. The one that hits people the hardest is the Pepperidge Farm Milano. <laughs> yeah. those, those delightful little gourmet looking cookies. Every one of them partially hydrogenated. But what's interesting is everybody's getting the word now it's a government mandate that you got to list it. Okay. So they're coming up with reformulation. You can bet that in the food industry right now, the biggest thing that's happening is everybody is reformulating all their recipes to literally take it out. So it's finally happened, but you know, 20 years of kind of, eh, what's it doing to you? Yeah. 
I know when I went to Queens a year and a half ago, part of it was because I was eating ignorantly. Okay? So, if, if I'm real strong on this part, it's that I knew 20 years ago what was bad, but like a lot of other people, I didn't, I didn't bring it to your attention because I didn't have a platform. I didn't even practice it myself. But you don't need to go one day more, you know. Hey, you go and you see the, the kids. <laughs> we went to the, um, went around the corner to where the pop tarts were. And then these little things like for um, the Lion King treats for the little kids. Yeah. My high school kids were getting mad because they said, my little brother eats that crap. <laughs> He says, worse, I eat Pop-Tarts every day. <laughs> he said, that stuff is full of hydrogenated oil. Okay? So he stopped eating Pop-Tarts. But you know what? When we went to Down to Earth to take a look at it, he saw alternatives that did not have any hydrogenated oil, probably had a little bit better alternative for him. And you know, a lot of kids, I said, you have a choice today. You can pick one healthy drink, one sandwich, or one dessert. Most of the kids pick, you know, the, the Govinda smoothies or stuff like that. A couple kids tried the um, veggie pate and things like that, and they liked it. Okay. And what's interesting, too, is that um, we all have to prepare. I'm not, I don't want to get on any kind of political thing, but just you look what's happening in the Alawai, right over here. Yeah, the Alawai, and you know, we did a lesson in school about the bird flu. Yeah, and we're the gateway right now. Whether you folks believe it or not, your body has to be ready. Your body has to be able to resist infection to the best of your ability, and antibiotics or not. Okay. And if your body is a walking magnet for all the garbage that this world you know, presents to you, then you're going to catch it quicker and you're not going to be able to resist. So, okay. Any cardiologists or medical people here in the audience? I remember doing one where I was carving prime rib at one time. Carving prime rib for a uh, surgeon's uh, convention. And most of the, when the doctors came to, they said, give me the, the real rare part over there with the fat hanging on. <laughs> and I laughed, but you know what? At that time, I was not, you know, I was saying, boy, I could sure go for that myself. I used to love that. Yeah. But I remember when I went to see my, my one of my relatives at Queens, he was at one time a semi-professional golfer, never always a very lean individual. I went to the hospital and I didn't expect to see what I saw. Both his legs were amputated. And that's when he told me about what his doctor told him. We're talking about eight years ago, yeah, ten years ago. Uh, he said his doctor said, asked him how, to, how he analyzed his diet, his habits. And this guy used to go and he loved his desserts, especially whipped cream, ice cream, you know, things like that at the end of the meal. But he would eat a very high fat diet. He loved his meat, he loved his, you know, the, the fatty part of the pork, the beef, whatever, the part that crackles. Okay. And you know what? He was not diabetic. He did not have a circulation problem. However, the doctor told him that little by little, what was happening is, is the arteries at his extremities were starting to plug. So when they tried to give him antibiotics, they had to do it locally first because it wasn't reaching. He would go down to his knee, stop, and go back because there was no circulation down to his feet. At Christmas time, he was walking to the house. He stubbed his toe. And from then on, he developed pus, gangrene, came into Queens, and that was what happened up here. How old was he? He was in his uh, late 60s. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to find that. <laughs> Even when you, you got to check your vitamins, because you know the capsules? 
You know that Knox gelatin, right? Come off from beef product. So you have to check to see if you're a vegetarian caplets or if they're made you know, from non-animal product. Yes. You know, we catered a vegetarian wedding in Kahala. I don't know if you saw it on Tasty and Meatless a year ago, a couple years ago. The wife, wife and husband, they're both lawyers. Her family was coming here from San Francisco. His family was coming here from Long Island. Very, very well-heeled bunch of people. And th- this couple decided that they don't care what mom and dad says. We're going to have them eat our food, but we want it to look gourmet. We want it to taste gourmet. And we want people to enjoy it and see how you can, you know, actually have it work. So we did little soy chicken with teriyaki. We did char siu. We had toothpicks in, in it. And on one part that never got on TV, we saw the outtakes. Here's a guy with his Heineken beer. And there's a tray. You see the tray with all these little teriyaki soy chicken and char siu bites. And we actually did chicken satay too. He's standing there with his Heineken beer going like this. Boy, this stuff is really good. goes well with the beer. And he's just banging it in and, and enjoying it. Okay. Wasn't solicited. He actually enjoyed himself. And he says, you know, hey, see? Mom, I'm eating healthy. <laughs> Let's thank Chef Onishi for the marvelous presentation of vegan cooking. Um, please go to the kitchen and enjoy a sample of what you've seen getting cooked. If you have the inclination, if you'd fold up your chair and bring it to the back of the room, that would help us a lot. And thank you very much for coming. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.